Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers and the uh, session chairs for putting on such a spectacular meeting. Every year that I come to the fly meeting and go home, I'm re-energized, and I think we have the Drosophila community still has a lot to offer in understanding many basic biological processes. And so I'm pleased to be able to tell you a little bit about what's been going on in my lab in recent years. So the title of my talk is a little different from what was in the abstract. I'm going to give a little bit more of an overview and perhaps a simplified view of how neuroendocrine uh, signals and autophagy control a nutritional checkpoint and developmental timing in Drosophila. So the transition that we've been interested in is metamorphosis, and here's three dramatic examples that I'm sure you're all familiar with. So this process involves a complete transformation of the body plan, and the sort of uh, evolutionary uh, rationale for this type of development is that it helps disperse the species into new ecological niche. So, for example, insects uh, become, go from a land base to a, able to fly. Sea urchins, the dispersal phase is actually the larval phase where sea currents carry them to new places. And, of course, amphibians go from water to air and land animals. So, how, the big question is, how do these uh, animals that use this indirect a method of development, know that it's time to go from the juvenile phase to the adult phase. And that's what I'd like to talk today about. So our model, of course, is Drosophila. And this shows, again, a simplified uh, view of the central processing system. So it's been known for over a hundred years since the pioneering work of Stefan Kopik that it's a brain-derived signal that's responsible for triggering metamorphosis. Uh, in, if we fast forward 70 years, Hiroshi Kataoka's lab identified a brain signal that had the capacity to stimulate ectisome production when added ex vivo to the prothoracic gland, which is the second part of this uh, uh, circuit. So the prothoracic gland is responsible for making the steroid hormone or the prohormone called ecdysone. This gets converted by peripheral tissue into the active hormone 20 hydroxy ecdysone. So one of the big issues we've been concerned in about recently is how does the environment, various environmental uh, signals, uh, influence this developmental process? And I think there's a great example recently uh, concerning tissue damage and how that's able to influence and slow down development. This is work from uh, Pierre Leopold's lab, uh, Maria Dominguez, Adrian Halmy, and several others, who showed that when imaginal discs are damaged, there's production of uh, a relaxing insulin-like factor called DILP8, this, by some mysterious means, is able to bind to its receptor, uh, so it gets past the blood-brain barrier, and activates a subset of neurons called the LG3 neurons. And you can see here that there's uh, these guys innervate the PTTH-producing neurons, which uh, then it's thought that this acts as a negative a regulator of the activity of these neurons, so it slows down development and allows for correction of the damage. So what I want to talk about, though, is nutritional control and how that's able to also influence the timing of development. So when we think about nutritional checkpoints in Drosophila, there are two that have been defined. These were originally identified in Lepidoptera species. And one's called the critical weight. And this is defined as the weight at which starvation does not delay metamorphosis. There's also what's known as the minimal viable weight, which uh, is the weight needed to produce a viable adult. 
And so if we divide up the third instar phase, we have the pre-critical wait period and then the terminal growth period. And what's happening here is that if we starve during the terminal growth period, after the critical weight and minimal viable weight, we can imagine that there's enough nutrient stores built up and the organism senses this and knows there's enough nutrients in over order to make it through the non-feeding pupil stage. And so if you starve during this uh, time, the battery is full, so to speak, and the animal can progress with uh, out the way to produce a viable adult. However, if we starve before this checkpoint, or this combination of checkpoints, the energy stores are not sufficient to allow the larvae to make it to the viable adult, so it will delay development in hopes of finding a new nutrient supply. Eventually, these will die. Sometimes they'll make a small pre pupae but this has not passed the minimal viable weight, so they, they don't produce uh, viable adults. So let's consider what is a biological checkpoint. Now, we're all familiar with the classic example of the cell cycle. And so this, rep, this, is, uh, this kind of checkpoint has a surveillance system or um, some sensing system that's responsible for monitoring the proper completion of the event within the cell. And when the checkpoint system detects a failure of the event, it uh, signals and calls for the inhibition uh, of the events downstream of the failure. So we can imagine or consider this as the default is go. Sensing determines if everything is okay. If not, it sends a stop signal. But it's also possible that you could imagine having a default or a waiting period and what it's doing, the sensing system is waiting for a, a go signal. So I'm going to argue that these nutritional checkpoints in Drosophila actually have a combination of a go and a stop signal. And these are the following. We think the go signal is reaching a threshold level in the production of a disone, and that this stop signal involves removing the precursor for the synthesis of a disone, which is cholesterol. Okay, so let's go and now consider how PTTH, this uh, presumed central neuropeptide that produces or stimulates production of ictisone, uh, its role in this checkpoint. So this work was done by Mary Jane Schimmel in my lab. It's been a collaboration with Nuria Romero in uh, Pierre Leopold's lab. And each one made mutations in PTTH in our lab by Talens. And uh, in, Nuria, in Pierre's lab, Nuria used Wrong and Golic method. I must say, I think this represents a transition as well, because I don't think anybody will ever use these techniques again to make null mutants. Um, the interesting feature of these mutants, if we look at the timing of pupation, so this on the uh, uh, axis here is the uh, percent pupation and time is along the x-axis, we see that these guys are still able to make pupa, and in fact they make viable adults, they're just slightly larger, and they own, this process only exhibits a one-day delay. It is nutritionally regulated because if we put them on poor food, you can see that the delay increases uh, an extra day, so two days on poor food. So this is uh, kind of striking considering that PTTH was thought to be the key regulatory neural peptide for stimulating production of a disome. But obviously the animals can get along just fine without it. Now again, if you think about it from an ecological point of view, these animals are delayed so when you're flies are feeding on an ephemeral food source like rotting fruit, of course they're going to be at a disadvantage. So in the environment, uh, having the PTTH mutant would be detrimental or presumably detrimental for survival. So what about the checkpoints? If we look at the critical weight checkpoint we see in wild type, 
that it takes about eight hours during the early third instar to reach this transition, and then 35 hours during the terminal growth period. If we look at PTTH mutants, we see that the critical weight checkpoint has been uh, delayed. So now it's about uh, uh, 12 hours uh, uh, delayed, and there's also a delay in the terminal growth period. So once again, this tells us that PTTH is not essential for uh, having a checkpoint, but it helps determine when that checkpoint occurs. Now the interesting thing, a number of years ago, we actually ablated the PTTH neurons, and you see, again, but a more striking delay in the setting of a critical weight checkpoint. It's still there, it's just much delayed. So this tells us a couple of things. First of all, because there's this big difference between a PTTH null and the neuron ablated animals, there must be other signals coming from the PTTH neurons that are uh, involved in setting the critical weight checkpoint. Furthermore, uh, in the ablation animals, since they still have a checkpoint, there must be signals that are non-neuronally derived, maybe from a systemic signals such as insulin that are involved also in setting this checkpoint. So what's going on? Why are they growing slower? And why is this checkpoint delayed? Well, if we look at the uh, biosynthetic enzymes, the expression of the biosynthetic enzymes, you see in green here is the wild type. It rises up uh, to high titers right before metamorphosis. But you can see in the PTTH mutant animals that there's a significant delay in the rise of the, the steady state uh, levels of the biosynthetic enzymes. And this is pretty much true for all of the biosynthetic enzymes that we know about. If we look at the actual titer of ecdysone, we see the same thing. Wild type rises up with much faster kinetics than does the uh, PTTH mutant. Now there's an interesting correlation here. If we look at where the critical weight check Point is occurring. In wild type, it's occurring at about 8 to 10 hours, and in the mutant, it's at about 20, 24 hours. And interestingly enough, this correlates with a sort of threshold value of production or levels of ecdysone of about 8 micrograms per larvae. So we're wondering then, is critical weight uh, part of the, the signal reaching a threshold level in the uh, level of ecdysone. So uh, some additional evidence that this is important came from a paper by, from Kristen Murr's lab a few years ago, where they looked at the critical weight checkpoint when they feed the animal ecdysone. So this is known as breakpoint analysis here. Again, we're looking at the time to preparation and the age at which you starve the larvae. So this checkpoint is defined by starvation. So you see at these early times, the, in wild type, there's no pupa able to form. And as you get closer to the checkpoint, you see some pupa forming, but ve with very delayed timing. And then when you reach the checkpoint, there's a dramatic transition in the amount of time it takes to reach pupation. But if you feed them ecdysone, you can see even from the very beginning, they make pupa. These pupa aren't viable because they don't have the minimal viable weight. But nevertheless, you can see you completely eliminate the checkpoint. So another, I think, important paper came from Kim Rewitz's lab, who showed that after the critical weight checkpoint, there's a feed-forward mechanism that involves ecdysone and the ECR receptor, and so this helps ramp up the production of ecdysone, and that this likely, uh, once you reach that threshold level, is able to self-sustain itself, and that's part of the uh, reason that uh, after the checkpoint, starvation does not influence the time. So how does PTTH send its signal? Uh, this was uh, worked out by Kim Rewitz when he was a postdoc in my lab. He identified torso as the receptor for PTTH. The signals to a MAP kinase cassette. 
and ultimately controls the conversion of cholesterol to a glycol. But how does it do that? Um, obviously, there's likely to be some transcription factors that might be phosphorylated by ERK, but at the moment we really don't know which they might be. The best one so far was identified by Chris King-Jones, who showed that the nuclear receptor DHR4 cycles into the out of the nucleus in the PG gland, and this is dependent on torso and PTTH signaling. However, the direct targets for the biosynthetic enzymes are directly regulated by DHR4 is not known. But another interesting possibility is a paper from a Naoki Yamanaka's lab who showed that there's a correlation between nutrient-dependent endocycling and the timing of metamorphosis. So it turns out that critical weight represents a transition between 16N and 32N in the DNA copy number in the PG gland. So this provides a mechanism by ramping up the number of templates the transcription can occur on to help in the production of the disome. So we were curious whether perhaps PTTH might be also working to influence endocycline. And so this, we took advantage of some genetic tricks to produce uh, glands in which one side is innervated, so you see the varicosities of the PTTH um, uh, neurons uh, projecting onto the PG gland, and on this side it's not innervated, and you can see that there's a substantial difference in the size of the nuclei. And that this is PTTH is shown here because in a PTTH null mutant, the nuclei are size is independent of whether there is the innervation or not. Well, as in the heterozygote, the innervated side is bigger than the non-innervated side. We can also see that the cells, the individual PG cells, the innervated cells produce more of the biosynthetic enzymes than do the non innervated cells. So again, consistent with the idea that uh, perhaps the endocycles are important in producing the high level of biosynthetic uh, enzymes. So at this point then, I'm going to suggest that it's a th reaching this threshold of E that provides the GO signal and that PTTH helps determine the time to this threshold. So what about uh, a stop signal? Is there also a break in this system that's part of the checkpoint control? And so I would suggest that there is. Let's go back to these definitions. And the central or the key uh, component here is that these assays rely on starvation. So we generated a hypothesis that perhaps it's differential induction of autophagy in the PG and that this is the functional mechanism responsible for delaying metamorphosis. So we decided to look at that. Well, first, let's just review the basic uh, features of autophagy. It's a nutrient-controlled process, which involves formation of an isolation membrane. Uh, ATG8, I'm going to use uh, as a marker for the formation of these autophagosomes which engulf cytoplasmic and organelles, and then after fusion with the lysosome, allow for degradation of those components to help with uh, nutrient supply. Now, it's been known that autophagy occurs in endocrine tissue, in other systems, but it's not clear what it does there. So we looked both pre- and post-critical weight at the level of of autophagy that can be induced by starvation. And what you see here is that pre-critical weight, as well as post, under the fed condition, there's a number of these very large uh, vesicles that are marked with ATG8. But after starvation, but only pre-critical weight, you see that these seem to break down, and there's a lot more of these very small puncta. Post-critical weight, again, there does not seem to be the ability to induce the formation of these small puncta. 
uh, and this is quantitated here, and you can see that there's a general decline in the ability with time to produce these uh, small vesicles. We look to see whether all the ATG8 genes are, re are required for this process, so is it really autophagy? And we can see that knockdown of most of the components do produce a reduction in the level of formation of these puncta. But we think this is a, a non-canonical form of autophagy, and part of that comes from when we looked at live imaging. Um, you can see that there's this tubular network, very dynamic network, that forms in these cells upon starvation. Also, there's several different component types of dynamic uh, control here. Uh, we see these large puncta seem to be able to be um, um, uh, split up and uh, that uh, they lose their contents, and it seems to be via um, depletion via these tubular networks. We also see some unusual ring-like structures. We don't know what these mean at the moment that also come out of these large vesicles. So what about uh, um, critical weight control? We see that if we knock down the ability to form these vesicles by either knocking down ATG1 or overexpressing an activated form of REB, which uh, will affect TOR signaling, that we shift the formation of critical weight. And in case of REB, there is no critical weight at all. This is just like feeding a disone. But more importantly, you see up here that normally at early times we can't form pupa. We now begin to be able to form pupa in the, uh, when we knock down autophagy. Uh, if we look again at the pupation rate and also the viability, we see under normal conditions that there's not many pupae formed early, but as you suppress autophagy, you begin to make pupae, but these are too small and aren't able to survive. So if you look at viability, there's not much difference. Uh, there's the, uh, uh, even these guys that form at early stage aren't able to give viable, they aren't able to close. So clearly we're affecting minimal viable weight determination. So then we wanted to know what happens if we induce autophagy late during the L3 stage. So we use the gene switch system to overexpress ATG1 to stimulate formation of these autophagosomes. And you can see that when we do this, we delay the time of development. In fact, many are arrested, so you don't make, uh, again, viable um, pupae. So before, if you deplete before, it, and we look at ecdysone levels, if we suppress autophagy, we see ecdysone in, in the system goes up. If we induce autophagy late, we aren't able to produce enough uh, ecdysone. So open questions at this point. What is it that's sequestered, degraded, or perhaps secreted by the PG uh, autophagosomes? Is it biosynthetic enzymes, mitochondria, ER, where the uh, enzymes are located? Is it signaling components, such as torso or insulin receptor? Is it an ectisone itself? Or is it perhaps the precursor cholesterol? And the second is what shuts down autophagy post-critical weight? So we looked at expression level of biosynthetic enzymes, and as you can see here, there doesn't appear to be any apparent reduction when we stimulate autophagy. However, when we look at cholesterol distribution, we see that cholesterol is co-localized with these autophagosomes. It also co-localizes with NPC1, which is a known trafficking component for cholesterol. So the key experiment then was to ask, if we induce autophagy late, which delays development, then uh, feed these guys cholesterol, you can see that it completely rescues the developmental delay, and these are viable. So what about the issue of what blocks autophagy after critical weight? And this makes sense because you don't want to uh, waste the time getting rid of the biosynthetic uh, 
uh, capacity of the gland once you have enough nutrient stores. So it's important probably that you shut this down after you go past critical weight. And one thing that we noticed was that there was a, uh, an enrichment of a different uh, receptor tyrosine kinase, ALK, which codes for the, or is the anaplastic plastic lymphoma kinase, and it localizes to the pre, uh, PG cell surface post-critical weight, and we can knock it down with uh, RNAi, and you can see that its distribution is gone. So we wondered if it was a signal provided by ALK that was involved in the shutdown. So we looked at what happens when you lose ALK post-critical weight. If we deplete it, you can see that now you can induce autophagosome formation. And likewise, if we do the converse experiment where we activate ALK pre-critical weight, now you prevent the formation of these autophagosomes. So this is consistent with this signaling system being involved in shutting down autophagy. And lastly, is the ligand, which is jelly belly, produced uh, by the PG neurons? And you can see here that we see nice co-localization of JEB with the, in, within the varicosities that, express, that have PTTH. And again, if we knock down the signal um, with RNAi, this uh, um, JEB production within these neurons is eliminated. So let me summarize then what I've told you. PTTH has helped set the nutritional checkpoint. There are multiple inputs that control both stop and go signals at the nutritional restriction checkpoint. The goal signal we propose is a threshold of production in E followed by a feed forward mechanism dependent on ECR. The stop signal is a tissue specific temporally controlled activation of a non-canonical autophagy. And we propose that this autophagy alters cholesterol flux to rapidly shut down hormone production in response to nutrient restriction. And finally, that the jeb alk pathway turns down autophagy after the nutrition restriction checkpoint. So with that, I'll finish up and just acknowledge the people who did the work. I'm Mary Jane in my lab and Nuria in Pierre's lab did the PTTH work while the autophagy was done by a very talented graduate student, Zhu Yang Pan. Thanks so much, very much for your attention.